Hello, welcome and welcome back. This is Jacob and today we are going to be rounding up our Lone Trail experience with this final bonus episode in which we're going to go over a lot of stuff that we couldn't before because of various reasons, of course. But before we do so, if you're someone who hasn't had the opportunity yet to finish up the Lone Trail story and uh, the stuff surrounding it, I would highly recommend doing so. And the playlist for it is in the description of the video if you just want to sit back, relax, listen to the entirety of this story and many, many other stories being both narrated and voice acted. Uh, enjoy, especially the Lone Trail series includes, uh, here on the channel at least, includes a lot of uh, extra bonus material that uh, just expand even more on this already gargantuan gargantuan story so enjoy the trip it is definitely a worthwhile one and of course uh thank you all of you for all the support that you have shown uh so far and uh especially over the past couple of weeks for the channel and uh i've been over this already a couple of <laughs> a couple of parts so all i can say thank you i am very humbled by all the support all the comments that have been left and uh all I can say is, yeah, thanks. <laughs> there is much more to be covered here on the channel, uh, both for the still available stories in Ark Knights that need to be covered and uh, upcoming stories. So, welcome, and I hope you enjoy the ride alongside this channel. Alright, but what we're going to be covering in today's episode uh, goes as follows. Uh, first and foremost, you can find timestamps for every single one of the segments in the uh, comment section of the video. Uh, so just hop and skip to any of the parts you want. But we're going to be beginning with the case investigations. And we're going to go over all of them in all of their separate segments, of course, as well. Then we're going to go over the pictures and the lore on them. And I'm also going to be using the pictures along that ra run to uh, uh, ramble a bit about the story. I uh, hope you guys don't mind. And then we're going to include a bunch of extra tiny little... Well, a bunch. We're going to be including... Uh, a couple of extra trivia uh, observations and stuff and one of the things I forgot to mention at the end of the previous episode uh, you'll see what it is when we get to it and um, a bunch of stuff that also unlocked with the extra stages along the lines and uh, then we're also gonna round it up uh, with the yes the metal lore will be included here and uh, haven't done this one in a while but this one is Definitely one of the more important uh, metal sections that I will definitely be including with their descriptions into this video. And uh, then at the finale I'm just gonna do the usual stuff that I couldn't do because of the massive size of the, the final episode of the story and uh, me being completely exhausted after that thing. Uh, that was two days of recording by the way. Uh, but yeah, I'll be talking about the usual stuff, my thoughts, opinions, yada yada, uh, impressions about the story and so on and so forth, and I'll try and keep myself short because uh, this was a massive story <laughs> with a lot of stuff. But anyway, let us begin with our first section, which is the case investigations. Okay then, and we shall begin the investigation section here with the shaft, of course, and the main page here because a tiny detail changes here once you are done 100%. And it's the message here at the bottom right. And it says now, Kirsten pointed it at the sky. Who should we point it at? The original message that was here, which is a descriptor for the shaft, can be still found in the picture section, but more on that later. First, let's go over the three parts that are being unlocked through this investigation. Part 1 is titled Mission Briefing. And it goes as follows. In the 40s, the DoD tried to exert their influence on Bolivar, but ended up turning her into a grisly meat grinder. Since then, they have been unable to face both the federal and coalition governments, with the Federal War Preparation Act serving as the best proof of their compromises. A number of generals have strived to turn the tables on this decline, for there is nothing soldiers crave more than a strong military, and Colombia's rapid technological development was, to them, the dawn of a new era. Hence, the DoD extensively approached and invested in a wide range of tech companies, so much so that it used to be said that any business plan need only mention weapon and propose to attract military investment. The president used to be pleased by the DoD's behavior, for it more or less promoted healthy competition benefiting the country, and their eagerness could eventually bolster Colombia's strength. The numbers don't lie, the DoD's extensive investments into R&D over the past few decades have indeed greatly enhanced our national defense capabilities. However, the generals did not get the payoff they desired. 
The politicians cunningly snatch their achievements away, presenting their efforts as contributions to the country while the situation remained unchanged over the decades. I'm sure you know what those old-timers who inherited the legacy of the revolutionaries in the 50s were thinking. They wanted to wash away the stain known as Bolivar from their uniforms, and the political upheavals never provided them their chance, and so they decided to add another competitor to their arms race. And I don't need another weapon, but still a tool vital to national defense policy. Yes, the Horizon Arc project was approved, not because of what it contained, but the fact that the proposal managed to pass is a testament to its merit. Rhinelab does not focus primarily on military industry, but the DoD still had the audacity to invest in them. Who knows just how many contractors have been cursing them behind their backs for this betrayal. So the president is basically implying that we might go to war someday in the future, but it won't be started by the DoD. Perhaps the military feels as if they're the ones being oppressed, and what they are protecting is the future of this country, but the Horizon Arc project is nothing but a trigger for the wars to come an unsuspecting fuse, and nothing more. We must stop them at any cost. Our next stop in here is the interview from the past. This is uh, an interview between two people, a journalist uh, referred to with the letter J, and the uh, engineer Nasty. So just like in the narration, I will do voices for both of them, so let us proceed. So this is part two, interview from the past beginning with the journalist. Thank you for agreeing for this interview, Miss Nasty. Thank Jara. She put all my other work on hold, leaving you the only thing on my agenda. I just can't fathom why you reporters won't give me a break. It's a historic achievement for a circus like you to reach an executive level position in a, Colum in a Colombian tech company, so the public is very interested in you. So, should I go rent an enclosure at the zoo to stay in until your curiosity has been satisfied? Miss Nasty, I've met many others just like you, and no matter how much you deny it, surely it's as plain as day that nowhere but Colombia would have given you this opportunity in the first place. <sighs> Let's just get it on with. Excellent. <clears throat> so, you learned architecture while, while in exile? Correct. Oh, I can already imagine the army of struggling college students resenting you for that. Though your origi originium arts are quite unique indeed. I presume your circus sensibilities must have helped a lot? They're nothing compared to other banshees. Does every banshee carry a pen as sleek and modern as yours then? No, this is my own redesign. Incredible. I think you might just start a new trend. Miss Nasty. You've always been upfront that you grew up in castles, so why did you leave your homeland for Colombia? The civil war was about to break out, and I didn't want to get involved. That's it? That's it. Was there nothing more sentimental behind, behind it? Perhaps you fought with your mother or which side to choose, or a brother's death left you distraught? That's none of your business. Miss Nasty, you may be unused to being on the camera, but I would like to remind you that you're currently a figure of public interest. Every oppressed sarcasm in this country has their eyes on you, and your attitude might very well affect their circumstances. <laughs> so, let's be honest with each other, shall we? Fine. It was neither someone's death nor the looming war on the horizon that made me leave Kazdal. To my knowledge, most Sarkas are rather belligerent. Why else would you people always be getting into wars, right? Though you personally are anti-war, are you not? No one likes war. Oh, I like this answer, a Sarkas pacifist. Lastly, I, I'd like to know, do you think you'll stay on as the director of Ryan Lab's engineering section long term? I don't particularly care for the position. I'm only here because someone promised me a dream. A uh, dream. And Nasty asked, uh, uh, answering back in, in Sarkas. A muddled dream. And this was a excerpt from an interview transcript from seven years ago. Our next stop and final stop for the Shaft investigation is part three. Conrad Jackson. I know what's on your mind, rookie. 
Shaft is still nominally under the DoD, with city defenders on patrol and you think that's a signal that they're breaking the ice with the central government? Yes, you're right, Jackson was a military brat and has close ties to plenty of generals. He wouldn't have won the election back then without the DoD support. Someone tried to rub him out this time, yet he still stepped forward to act as a bridge between the DoD and Maylander. You can't shake the feeling that Jackson threw away what should rightfully have been our and Maylander's achievements. You're still a bit wet behind the ears. Our goal was never to shut down the DoD, they're a part of Colombia too, and we need only make them understand the new position they're in. If Jackson, if Jackson hadn't taken the initiative then, we might have suffered even more casualties, politicians and officers. He had the DoD concede at just the right moment, and even made a per, uh, personal guarantee that the DoD and Maylander w uh, wouldn't clash again. After we discovered that Kirsten's goal was no threat to national security, everyone involved was sh uh, showering him in praise, especially the generals. Got it, kid? You should be admiring him. Put yourself in his shoes, even if you had time to mull it over, would you have had the guts to make the same decision, standing amidst all that hostility, right after an assassination attempt? Huh. <laughs> so you're not a complete idiot. Right, he didn't toss out the fruit of Maylander's labor, but simply shoved it into his own pocket instead. And there's nothing wrong with that. The relationship between the previous vice presidents and Maylander is like a seesaw. Sometimes the stronger side does have more influence on things, it is what it is, but if we all want to keep playing this game, then it's best not to start a winning streak. So now that we're on the same page, you should be crystal clear on why the higher-ups are glad to see this happen. Everything we do is for Colombia. Alright, and we shall proceed with our next section. And we continue in the next investigation section, which is for the hammer. And just like for the shaft, here in the bottom right now it says, Conquering the sky is the first step on the journey towards the stars. A journey we have embarked on. And just like prior, the original message can be found in the picture section. But for now, let us go over the three documents unlocked through this one. Part 1 is titled, A Diary Entry. Regardless of how the media will spin their story, I know at the very least that Colombia did not let the brights down. Their research funding applications should have been impeded at multiple phases, even with fanatical astrology scholars and scientific conspiracy theorists after their lives, Colombia acknowledged their intelligence and the country would never mistreat scientists of their caliber. So Maylander sent me to solve their problems. Their deaths were purely an accident. If there was a conspiracy, it could only have been my own. They simply failed. Failure is an everyday occurrence in my business, in any business, while success is often accidental. Even the price they paid for it seems normal enough to me. Their lives. I really should just finish this report and send it to the Tin Man before relaxing at my villa until my next assignment. That's how it should be. However, I had some history with the couple from work. Any practical difficulties they encountered were meaningless in the face of their zeal and cleverness. How could anyone hate them, people who explored the unknown, shining even brighter the more difficult the situation? Even if they were denied praise and recognition for their failure, they shouldn't have been mocked and ridiculed by both their peers and laymen after their deaths. Some fanatics even made pilgrimages to the crash site. I saw their daughter at their funeral as well, Kirsten Wright. She didn't cry or make a fuss, she simply looked at the sky. I could never forget the expression she had then. It's appeared in my dreams too often for that. I must do something for her. This was a page from Jara Booker Wilson's diary. Next up, part 2, titled A Meeting. The following is a summary of an emergency meeting held by the DoD right after the hammer took to the skies. Soldiers, I want you all in position. This mission is, dif is different. Our great Colombia has entered a state of war and the battlefield is right under our nose. Three mounts. The DoD has granted me the highest level of authority, requesting the full cooperation of four 
perimeter divisions and seven military bases. And everyone present will form our temporary command center. The order from above is clear, and I will repeat it word for word. Get that Rhine lab ring down, whatever it takes. The target's altitude is currently 240 meters and rapidly climbing. Our existing military aircraft are unable to fly as high as it can, so we must endeavor to damage its propulsion system as much as we can during its liftoff window to prevent it from reaching its targeted altitude, or at least slow it down. This special operation will be divided among three teams. The drone attack team will be made of three attack squads, first a propulsion squad equipped with shockwave charges detonating them 500 meters from the target to provide a springboard for the other two squads to approach the target before it can adjust its altitude. Next, a demolition squad equipped with high explosives, aiming to unleash their payload on the target's outer armor. Everyone should have already been sent the details, and finally an assault squad to enter through the burnt-out hole and destroy it from the inside. The second team will focus on garnering support from all of our tech companies, companies and military contractors to employ whatever means they have to eliminate the target. Whoever shoots it down will essentially take over Ryan Lab's position, and with such an opportunity dangling in front of them, I believe they will be even more motivated than we are. Colonel Blake will personally lead the boarding party to the target in a prototype boarding craft. He will keep in touch via the frequency used for spec ops, so make sure you're Com channels are open at all times. Soldiers, if we do happen to survive this, I will be the very first to submit my resignation to the DoD. It is genuinely shameful to carry the rank of uh, rank and decorations of military honor after this humiliating experience. Perhaps it is time for the DoD to rethink the way we have looked at science, at technology, at these scientists. But before that, we must first complete the very first aerial campaign in Colombia's history. Perhaps even in all of Terra's military history. Terra bless us. Our third entry here is titled A Dialogue. Now before I begin, this is a conversation between two entities and from what I can tell, one is very clearly Kaltzit, the other one I believe is the Tin Man. Uh, I'm not 100% sure, but at least how it's worded and how the other person is speaking makes me believe so that it is. Uh, the Tin Man, but uh, that's up to in interpretations. I am not sure who else it could be from the story, uh, but because it's very hard to tell when one is speaking and when, when the other is speaking for the most part of this, I will just read through it. So, follow along. Anyway, part three, a dialogue. Every Colombian knows the Revolutionary War turning point was when Mark Max joined the fray. The tides of battle immediately reversed once he truly took the reins. Who could have imagined that the revolutionary army so close to collapse just a year earlier would under his command force a duke to abandon his ship and scramble back to Victoria, thereby establishing Colombia's independence? A good general is not necessarily a good president. While such doubts did uh, exist when he was elected, he proved through his actions that he was even better at being uh, president. Colombia could not have developed into what it is today without him. Today, no one doubts him for a moment, and his approval rating has been fault uh, has never faltered. Colombians feel blessed enough just seeing their president on TV and want him to stay so forever. And everyone knows it's possible too because Mark Max isn't really human. Yes, Celine Maylander did the right thing choosing to stay away from the public seat of power, instead of going backstage to set up a foundation to guide this country for Mark, a hyper-rational super-terminal that is never wrong. Do you still have doubts about him, after learning everything to do with the Preserver? No, I've long accepted the reality that my boss is a lump of iron, or rather, I actually feel even more of a connection with him now. It's just... Surely you're aware that Colombia intends to take over the legacy Kirsten left behind. I know, the support Silence received is a testament of that. In retrospect, the president may not have fully calculated Kirsten's actions before it happened, but by the time that ring-shaped lab took into the skies, he might already have envisioned something similar happening. You're implying that Mark could have stopped Kirsten if he wanted to. 
yes, that Ring's liftoff wouldn't have gone so smoothly otherwise. As for you, the Sarkas have extremely complicated feelings about your relentless interventions into their history, but let's put those emotions aside for now. We understand more than anyone else that you usually make the right choices. And a person like you chose to stop cursing. So tell me, Kautzit, do you still think she was in the wrong? No, neither of us were in the wrong. However, only time will tell which one of us which one of us is close closer to being right. And what does right mean to you? In our present context, it's synonymous with survival. All right, that was part three. On to our next investigation section. Continuing on with the Galeria Stellaria, we now have here in the main menu a new message as well, which says, We have longed for these stars for thousands of years. Now it is time to reach out. Once again, the original message can be found in the picture section later. But for now, let us go through the three entries for the Galeria. So, the first one is titled Guides, and it goes as follows. Do you know what it means to invite an astrologer here? It means to mock them, to insinuate that their investigations into the starry sky are shallower than those of a scientist who dismisses the stars we worship as less than nothing. But, well, I am the honorary president of the Colombian Astrological Research Association, so I'll tell you three stories. The first. In the distant days of old, when humanity lacked the intellect we have now, we primitive barbarians lived as the tusk beasts do, eating berries, drinking water, constantly fighting for territory, and treating each other as prey. However, even then, we'd already had an interest in the stars. There was a group of star-crazy fanatics among them, holding a nightly ceremony on the widest grassland plain they could find, to pray to the stars to descend. And one day, a shooting star really did cross the sky, so their journey began. They ran, ran, ran after it, until at last they realized they had ended up where they started. And so, that was the earliest evidence in history that Terra is actually round. Alright, I'm just kidding. The story isn't entirely fictional though. The Archaeolo Archaeologists Association has indeed discovered murals in different countries all from the same tribe, and they did indeed worship and follow the stars, chasing after any shooting star they spotted. In the end, they didn't catch a single one, but their footprints have miraculously survived in various corners of the continent, as did their traditions in other tribes. So by approaching it from that angle, could the stars have been a guiding symbol to these ancient people? To expand their horizons? To explore the unknown? This is a record co recorded conversation with the former senior agent Oheliak. Part 2 is titled Ignorance. And this is our second story. As it goes, the second. Once upon a time, there was an astrologer who loved the stars so much he kept looking for a way to touch them. He ended up scaling the highest peak of this great land and jumped down from there, slowly drifting to sleep in the space between the starry sky and the land. Yes, the protagonist of the poem Starpod is based on him. And such a man does indeed exist in the annals of history. He was a stargazer who also wanted to unravel the sky's secrets, making many observations and conjectures about the stars that even now seem advanced to us. He did not directly conclude that a barrier layer exists. After all, technology back then was far from what it is now. But unlike his peers, he did not regard the unexpected change in the stars as premonition. What do you think happened to him in the end? Scale the highest peak on Terra, like in the story? Huh. He did think to, but could not, because in the end, the leader of his clan ordered him to be burned alive for disrespecting the gods. I know all of this because his appearance apprentice managed to escape their settlement with his research materials, and those materials were scattered all across the land for centuries, and now lie in a museum founded by Maylander, I may as well also mention that I was the one who gathered them. Sadly, the materials he spent most of his life searching never actually contributed to the discovery of the barrier. 
because his apprentice also died suddenly, ending his legacy right there. Even more lamentable is how that poet must have used those documents to craft his story. The literati do have a bad habit of romanticizing beyond the point of reason. Just imagine if that man knew his legacy of exploring the sky had turned into a symbol of giving up on said exploration, he'd probably rise from the dead out of sheer anger. As times change and civilizations advance, the meaning of the stars has changed from a symbol of exploring to uh, the unknown to a garland of ignorance. You must admit that this is one of the more interesting things about history. Hmm? This was the another recorded conversation with the former senior agent Ho Heliak. And now for the third one, part 3, Unchanging. Our last story. There was a girl from a family of astrologers, and this family was fated to find a star that resides in this story. She had this destiny instilled into her ever since she was a child, and gradually came to believe that finding this star was her reason for living. Her hard work paid off when she finally found a clue, albeit one pointing in an unprecedented direction, but that made it all the more worth exploring. She threw herself into it fervently, and the deeper she dug, the more she believed that the answer she sought must lie at the end. She was so happy that in this generation she could realize her family's uh, century-long desire. But just as she was about to find the star, someone told her that the star she had been looking for was utterly meaningless. The girl couldn't possibly accept such provocation, but this person spoke so naturally as if stating an unquestionable fact. The girl also knew that this, this person was searching for her own star. She just she's just implying that the star she's chasing is brighter than my own. The girl wanted to get back at the person for her arrogance, and wanted to destroy her star while she wasn't paying attention. But after she gave it her all and finally found that person's star, she found it was already close to losing all of its light. Even so, she could tell how dazzling the star used to be. The girl came to realize that even if she found her own star, it would never shine brighter than this one. And even such a star eventually lost its brilliance. At that moment, the girl knew in her heart that the star she had been chasing had long since lost all of its brilliance. When one's faith completely crumbles, and all hope is blown away by the cold breeze of winter nights, the stars once again appear before us with unprecedented clarity, and we have no choice but to face the facts. The stars are just stars. So, what do we do next? This was the third uh, recorded conversation with former senior agent Ho Heliak. Next is the final section of the investigations. Alright then, and we shall finish off the investigation section with our final section here, the Hall of Stasis. And here at the bottom right now it says, Someday we will discover the secret of the cemetery. Perhaps it will no longer matter then. And just like before, the original message can be found in the picture section. But for now, let us round this up with the final three entries through this section. Part 1 is titled, The Only Clue. This is the Hall of Stasis, as Nasty called it in her testimony, that now lies only in ruins. The energy source has been exhausted, so it's impossible to determine the facility's function and purpose. The ice blue cubes should have something inside them, but we tried everything we could to open them, to no avail. Not even a single scratch. We're handing them over to the central lab and I hope the scientists boasting to be the country's number one can pull themselves together. The writing used in the lab is also a problem. We compared it with the writing seen in Tika's ruins, but spotted no similarities. In short, our investigation has left us with no conclusions other than that we still know absolutely nothing about this place. But we did find Nasty's secret lab, underneath building C of test site 102, on a hidden floor that can only be accessed by entering a password in the elevator. Test site 102 is a joint project between the government and Rhine Lab for civilian purposes. The project was launched three years ago around the same time as the Horizon Arc project, once again proving that what she did together with Kirsten was premediated. 
The secret lab is connected to both the Hall of Stasis and Shaft, so we can more or less conclude that the energy fired through Shaft at night came from the Hall. We didn't find anything here more valuable than what she presented to us. We did expect her to tell us only what she wanted us to know, and to erase any evidence of her lies to protect herself. But we didn't exactly find nothing. By restoring the communication records on one of the terminals here, we found some emails of her correspondence with Kirsten. The first email is dated July 11th, 1096, to Nasty from Kirsten, attachment unknown signal. Nasty, scientific investigations based in the outskirts received a signal from an unknown source. No one can decipher it, me included. Interesting. Since we can't decipher it, another way to go about it would be to find its source. However, scientific investigations equipment is unable to pinpoint a precise location. But I'm sure you can find a way. Looking forward to your report. The attached file with the unknown signal has been deleted, and the rest of the messages are encrypted. We'll need to meet with Nasty again. Part 2 is titled Emails. Miss Nasty has reluctantly provided us with the password. It seems she had anticipated this. Our investigation was worth it. Their emails reveal how Ryan Lab discovered the Hall of Stasis. We have summarized their correspondence for easy reading. November 3rd. The radio of yours has... That radio of yours has proved useful, Nasty. We've caught the source of the signal. But rather than solving the puzzle, it's revealed an even bigger one. The source lies about 100 kilometers northwest of Three Mounds, and 3,000 meters underground. Yes, you read that right, underground. I've tapped my government contacts to confirm that there are no projects running over there. Things are getting even more interesting. I need your help. December 16th. Direct your complaints elsewhere, Nasty. I would very much prefer to have you attending these events while I dig about underground. You can tell Justin Jr. that most of his questions aren't worth answering and he can act on his own, but I can answer yours. You ask me what I'm worrying about. I'm guessing your question is about more than this sudden excavation project, but also about the diabolic crisis, or maybe something even earlier, yes? My answer is simple. How can I not feel anxious when everyone around me is patting themselves on the back for their absolutely unremar unremarkable research results? Nasty, do you remember what you wanted to do when you left Kazdal? January 3rd. I had a dream. I was walking to the ends of the earth, where the sea meets the sky. There was a floating sphere, and I knew it was the answer I had been looking for. The answer told me I shouldn't have come. I'm not qualified. I'm not the one he has been waiting for, and I will never be myself again. But I didn't relent in my barrage of questions for him. If one can trade their life for answers, then surely nothing could be more valuable. The answer did not reply to me, but simply floated into the sky. I looked up. The stars were falling. January 12th. I'll head over right away. The messages end here. Miss Nasty says that she eventually returned to the surface and kept in touch with Kirsten through Ryan's internal channels. However, we found the email records have been erased when we checked the database. Kirsten's thoughts are an important window into this incident, so we need to find another way. And our final entry here, part 3, for this section is Here I Stand. In the Hall of Stasis, we found a personal terminal in a corner belonging to Kirsten. Most of the files are related to Shaft and Hammer, things we already know about. However, we also found the rest of the correspondence. February 9th. I've read all the messages you sent me. They weren't important enough to war warrant my re a reply. And now I've deleted them all, because they are absolutely worthless. I am writing this email to tell you. I did not die. Also, I saw God in a literal sense. There is no other way I could possibly describe Him. God spoke to me without pause and knew the answers to everything. He showed me the truth. I did only two things during the week you presumed my death without authorization. Question and reflect. But I must now inform you of the tragic truth. 
My obsession with the sky is no different from those emails I just deleted. Insignificant. The dream I had was real. February 11th. God has invited me to witness the death of everything from a first-class seat. An enticing offer. However, from the start, my thoughts on the sky were never as complicated as others like to imagine. I only want to see what hides behind it. I believe that unraveling the secrets within will guide us forward, and the truth has not disappointed me, but we might very well perish before getting glimpses of the future. The choice is simple then. To do as the poem describes, sleeping peacefully like a pea in a star pot, to die within a beautiful dream, or to suffocate in a vacuum, my belief has never wavered. We should die in the truth. I'm ready. February 17th. Attachment. Ideas on how to open up the sky. I'll be right back. And that is how this one ends. The rest we know from the story. So now let us proceed to the picture section. Alright, so let's go through the picture section, and we begin with uh, <laughs> the first picture, which is the technically last picture of the story that you unlock. Well, it is a picture you unlock in the menu more specifically, and it's titled, very aptly, Lone Trail. And for the descriptor it simply says, inextinguishable. And the other picture right below it is the other original menu picture titled, Intertwining Helixes. And you can swip, swap the background by the press of this button between one or two, whichever you prefer. But for our second picture, it says here at the bottom, the same path in different directions, the same goal by different means. Pretty much an apt descriptor for the entirety of the story, if you ask me. Multiple people on the same path going in different directions, yet they reach the same goal by different means. And the goal is the truth. For some, <laughs> a different kind of truth when you look back at the story. But we continue with our first CG of uh, the story, uh, titled Greeting Gift, and it says hello and goodbye. Uh, an apt opener for the story and then you get nothing until like stage 5 or 6. <laughs> it's been a long ride until you get the next one. But anyway, we continue with the ride. And it says, you could kill me, but who could you even save? Uh, that was the point in the story where Saria was still in that, I wouldn't say confusion, but in the place of she didn't fully focus her or set her mind to one thing that she wanna wants to achieve. She was along for the ride, but determination was uh, kind of lacking a bit still. But we continue with the next one. Confession. True death is when one has been forgotten. I will not lie, seeing this picture for the first time and when it started, this whole section started unfolding with Rosmontis did send quite a bit of shivers down my spine. Uh, but um, it was a good one and uh, I'm quite happy that this whole, whole thing between these two got brought to a very, actually very satisfying conclusion. Moving on, our next picture is brushing past. She steps into the light with her head held high, while the other cautiously approaches the abyss. And this is pretty much another apt picture for this entire thing, where Silence originally, after the whole di diabolic crisis and her discovering uh, the darker side of Rhine Lab and what is going on, she is now the one uh, standing in the light, head held high, moving in into the future in in a direction she she found her determination and she's she's going uh and we've seen at the end of the story that she's definitely finally making some uh movement happen inside of Rhine lab while at this moment still in the story this was where saria was still in that uh lost but almost at the right uh in the going in the right direction uh kind of segment which is aptly also signaled in the picture here with her uh looking downwards and being in shadow compared to Silence, who is in light. But anyway, we move on to the next one. Premonition. It slowly flew over everyone's heads, 
ensuring that everyone will remember it. And how could Three Mounts not remember it? Imagine if, for example, the ISS would be literally launched, not launched piece by piece into space, but launched right next to your city and above it and would float above it for a while until it goes into space. Ima imagine that sight. This, the ISS is not small. <laughs> but anyway, we move on to Coal Travelers. Simply saying, for Rhine Lab. And this was essentially the moment where, in the story where uh, Saria finally set, set on her path. Determination, uh, clear, uh, sharp, sharp look in her eyes, uh, bathed in light. She is now also moving forward, and she knows her destination finally. And that is Kirsten, of course. The next one is Fuse. Simply says, 3, 2. Launch. But anyway, we mo move on to the next one. Cloud Piercing Light. The residents of Three Mounts will never forget this view. Again. <laughs> Another one. They had quite the unforgettable night. <laughs> but yeah, who could, who could uh, forget a goddamn giant laser firing from the ground into a space station uh, slash lab in the skies above the city? Moving on to our next one. Limited time. Ferdinand thought he would be afraid, only to realize that the feeling is closer to amusement. I'll say this. First, I was surprised that Ferdinand is actually still alive. I think the vast majority of people believe that he got killed by the pioneers in the desert when he uh, was approached by him in that, in that power suit that he was in. I was actually very shocked and surprised that he is back and he is part of the story. However, just like with the other uh, directors and scientists, I like what this story did. And it was painting them as actual characters and actually showcasing uh, how they tick, why they are the way they are. It made them understandable to a certain degree, and I really liked it. Still, I still think he's an idiot <laughs> and a shithead. Uh, like the vast majority of directors, that is undeniable. They're all absolutely crazy scientists. As they should be, they're scientists. Not mocking actual scientists, but uh, let's be real here. If you ever listen to a scientist talk about science or uh, about other scientists, they will say that both they themselves and other scientists are actually idiot. Uh, crazy. Not idiots, sorry. <laughs> Wrong word. Crazy. But science needs craziness. Uh, but anyway, it made them more understandable and... Um, not in the sense of the word likable, but more tangible, I guess. But anyway, moving on to the next picture. Scolding. When facing the indomitable, only the people at your side can light your path. Now this was uh, a very interesting juxta juxtaposition to the previous picture where you see silence uh, bathed in light moving forward full of determination, only to be immediately shattered and back on her knees. Uh, by what Parvis did, but then uh, Ifrit appears and rattles her awake. I still... Uh, the sentence at the end here where um, it said on on a black screen, uh, but when did she get so big, uh, meaning Ifrit, that, that sentence still is such a good one, such, such aptly fit for that moment. Uh, but yeah, Ifrit sets her back straight and she moves onwards. Next one, Fate. In her eyes is an isolated galaxy, with a pioneer who has abandoned it all. In the others lies a resplendent land, with a warrior stubbornly holding on. What a picture. Two best friends squaring off for one final match. Oh boy, this was definitely an adventure. Uh, stuff that is actually missing from here that didn't appear as CGs is obviously stuff around the... Uh, Preserver and uh, all of that uh, stuff, but more on that when we get to the, f the 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 part later where I talk about the story in full. The next picture is False Atlas. It's time to look up, Terence. Very self-explanatory, and a very self-gratifying uh, and happy smile on this face. The next picture is Sky Splitting Pillar. It might be too early, or perhaps already too late. And I do love this uh, view of the laser hitting uh, the uh, barrier as it ripples away. It almost looks like the surface of water, but the water is also 
uh, covered in like a thin oil uh, film as it ripples away. And the next thing we see is the true sky. The true twin moons overlap with their false counterparts, and the truth of the sky is laid bare for all to see. So I've seen somewhere, I don't remember where, I've seen someone asking specifically for this picture, what the hell am I seeing in this thing? Uh, well, it's very self-explanatory as it says here down below, the true twin moons overlapped uh, with their false counterparts. Pretty much, the barrier shattered, uh, you can still see the ripples going out and uh, dissipating here around, uh, but as it is shattering, just like the surface of water, it is still distorting and carrying the like original picture essentially uh, forward and uh, in the middle you can see the actual moons but in the background you see the false moons the projections from the barrier and if I'm not completely incorrect this tiny bright spot in the middle is uh, the hammer station from uh, look looking at it from the ground level of course our next picture is looking up it's a long way back but there is still time. And this one is, again, looking back at the pictures of the two of them where they kept going from light into dark, into light into dark again uh, between each other. They're both now both beaten and bruised and tired, but they're both best in light. And they're both finally moving forward. Together, even. The next one. Columbia's Secret. A new age is upon us. The moment we learn that, yes, the burp on the shoulder of the vice president was the actual president the entire time. Mark Max. The burp, which is a construct, a machine, essentially. As it was saying, it is a machine that was made by the very same preserver, or at least the person who became the preserver originally. And as he also drops another lore bomb, the same... Uh, he's in the same category, so Mark here, is in the same category as PRTS, which very highly suggests that PRTS is in fact a true AI and not just, you know, an AI that is supporting uh, the Doctor and people aboard Rhode Island, which is uh, quite the revelation to be had there, but also very interesting. Uh, I wonder how that will develop. And there's another reminder, there are still a lot of things that we don't know about the landship Rhode Island. There are still many areas, or rather one specific area, if I believe correctly, that is always rumored to be off the map and not accessible. Uh, or maybe only one or two people know how to access it. Something is invisible. There was the uh, thing with Ines in Darknet's memoir saying when she used her arts to look at Rhode Island that she saw something that resembled a skeleton. Uh, the fact that Rhode Island was unearthed and then repaired and rebuilt. And uh, on top of all of that, and this is just me, this, this is my own uh, cookie cutter theory here, but the design of Rhode Island, the landship itself, has a very striking resemblance with how in uh, the in the game homeworld, they are designing uh, spaceships. I'll go with this theory for now. Rhode Island is an actual crashed lit, uh, spaceship that was retrofitted into a land ship, and um, I'll leave it at that. My theory. Anyway, this was this was interesting. This was very interesting. Next one is Lonely Elf. May you no longer be alone. Oh, Mulesies, going back and forth throughout this entire story. Loyalty to her old friends, trying to trust her new friends, but ultimately going back to her, her old friends, then being kind of betrayed, but also not betrayed, uh, even though she doesn't know about it. <sighs> you know what? Hopefully she finds a better, better place at home now. She did look happy at the end of the story, so good. Good stuff. And our final picture for the story... Farewell, Terra. Let us meet again in the true skies. Now, I'll say this. I heard only after I finished the story, I caught wind of uh, people uh, saying that they wish that Kirsten would appear in 
uh, Enfield now. Um, how to explain to people that the Hammer Station, the Hammer Laboratory that was shot into space, is not an interstellar vessel, but potentially will either drift away from the planet into space very slowly, or will remain in orbit above Terra. Now, I'm not saying that there is not a possibility that she comes back to Terra down uh, below once people in the future figure out how to, you know, crack open the barrier once again or permanently disable this thing. Uh, but she's floating in space in a stasis pod. Uh, and uh, that thing is not interstellar. <laughs> that thing is not capable of going across space. I don't know if Enfield, because I'm keeping myself blind from it, I do not know if Enfield talks about how far away Talos 2 is, or rather Talos in general, is from uh, the system where Terra is in. But from what we do know, and as uh, our dear Preserver has said in this story, and the trailer that was, I think, more recently re released on the official English channel, uh, talks about... There is a portal up north in the ice fields that will be eventually used to, tra to traverse space and land on Talos. Now, the be better question is how far away is Talos? How many light years? I don't think it's the same system, uh, personally, considering that when, uh, considering that when uh, the preserver in that final cutscene when the screen cuts to black and uh, we get get a flashback essentially to the initial conversation between Kirsten and the Preserver. Uh, they talk about space and, and so on, and he's essentially rattling off stuff. He's mentioning the sizes of things, he's mentioning a black hole somewhere out there that has a ridiculous size, a star. He mentions Talos and its rings, uh, and so on and so forth. But no specific coordinates or stuff like that. The only thing that we know that there is a portal that suggests uh, a traversal to another world, is when he explicitly says uh, with in, in the conversation with uh, um, the Doctor and uh, Kaltzit that there is a door up north in the ice fields, and you should go and take a look. But yeah, TLDR, I think she will be back in the far future if her stasis pod actually manages to keep her alive for that long. The question is when and where and how. Anyway, we move on to our final four, which are unlocked by 100%ing each of the investigation sections. First off is the shaft. And this are these are the original messages here, before they change when you completed 100%. So it says, part of the Horizon Arc project, commonly known as shaft, it gathers energy and sends it upwards to hammer. It can store en enough energy to power multiple nomadic cities simultaneously for quite a time. Here in the picture it says also, Minds of our land need to be united. We Terrans need a unified voice. For the Hammer, it says, Part of the Horizon Arc project, commonly known as Hammer, it absorbs the energy received from below and locks onto a target before firing, able to reach a range beyond most Terrans' reckoning. At the top here it says, The next age of us Terrans, an age when skies for the first time, will know their masters. The next one is the Galeria Stellaria, and it says, Designed by Kirsten Wright based on her personal tastes, the central planetarium is made with the finest cutting-edge technology, but the trajectories of the stars seem unfamiliar to the Terrans. And here it says, The way to, uh, the way to what is above this, the skies has been shown to us, a way that is inevitably both perilous and I cannot fully see the final word here but I think it says pro propithi propithius I'm not sure uh, but we move on to our final one which is the hall of stasis a mountain of cubes an ice cold cemetery what happened here is beyond our understanding and under the hall of stasis uh, banner it says one day in that age all we wished for will be ours. Well, if that is the message of um, <laughs> the old denizens and people who are asleep and forever asleep in these cubes, 
I hope there are more of you out there and um, you are still alive. But that is it for our pic picture section, so let us proceed to a bit of trivia. Alright, and now for a quick round of some interesting trivia surrounding the uh, couple of last stages and even uh, something else later on. But first, uh, one thing I want to address from the last episode of the narration, I completely forgot to mention at the very end when the final cutscene plays out after uh, the door to the future uh, is ending, after that final sentence that appears on the screen, uh, which reads as follows, what do they inevitably mean, and what is it that life ultimately seeks? Once that line is over, and you click further, you obviously will load back into here, but uh, you also get presented with a medal. The medal that is the answer to it, and it's the medal titled The Future. Sadly, I didn't have a recording going on when I was pre-reading the whole thing, so uh, I couldn't splice in, like, uh, <laughs> a portion of the footage just to have the metal pop up during that moment. So, I'm a bit sad. <laughs> I'm a bit sad about that, but I also, because I was so exhausted, I for completely forgot to mention that the metal pops up during that uh, specific time. And, uh, yeah. So, apologies for that. But, another thing I want to point out, and uh, here I want to uh, quote, well, a couple of you who have pointed it out, who have uh, caught up to it, uh, or noticed it, but yeah, essentially the story of Kirsten Wright is essentially obviously twofold. We have a direct reference to the Brothers Wright through her name and obviously her yearning for, you know, flight and stuff. But we also have another thing, which is that she is of the Pedo race, which means the dog, dog race, of course. Which also means, yes, uh, Kirsten is a direct reference to the first dog in space, Laika. <laughs> uh, the references. There are many more thing, uh, the references and stuff here. So for those of you who uh, picked up and know more of these references, feel free to post them in the comment section for people uh, who are gonna go through this episode in the future just to peruse and see what they are. Uh, I would much appreciate it myself to just see what other references there are. I, I did pick up on a couple of them. I mean, Preserver is... Well, design shape-wise, kind of literally Hall 9000, but, uh, you know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, to more directly quote now uh, a comment in the uh, final episode of the narration from uh, Evermoon3949, who, uh, amongst others, said about the metal stuff, also said a very interesting thing. And that is the titles of the final four nodes in here. So stage 9, 10, uh, ST3 and ST4. Now, when we read them here in English, they spell out love and hatred, lost among the stars, uh, those left behind, door to the future. Now, that is aptly correct. This is how they are. Th this is how they uh, placed it in English, uh, localized it in English, rather. However, there is another trans. If 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 it is apparently directly trans translated, pardon, Jesus Christ. If it is directly translated from the Chinese. It says, Love and hate entangled, dissipated among the stars, those who are left behind shall open the gates to the future. A couple of words are missing, but yeah, th these last four pretty much form a single sentence. So, uh, thank you for pointing that one out. And, uh, yeah, we have one extra little thing here in the EX stages, which is here on EX8. The title, uh, or rather the stage, where you're fighting Kirsten yet again. Uh, and it says, Lonely light, the stars dance in her hand, pouring down from the heavens like a river. And then we have our very special section here. But before I go into this, the three categories for our uh, stages, from story to EX to special stages, are titled The Coming of the Future for the Story, the EX stages, the lingering of the past, and the special stages, the pursuing of the present. And these are the special stages. A new age is upon us. Once again, the moniker of this whole uh, side story. The hammer station floating here above Terra in the emptiness of space and darkness. And the stages are in Morse code. 
And below, we see the surface of Terra, the barrier rippling away as it is. Uh, first off, uh, pictures, picture speaking wise, and on first glance, uh, seeing this immediately remind me, remind me of like looking at uh, like the lit up sea floor <laughs> in the ocean uh, at night, because this is. If you've never seen how sand looks at the bottom of uh, at the bottom bottom of an ocean, uh, because of uh, tides and uh, just the movement of the water, pretty much resembles that same picture. And so uh, I love this. Uh, but anyway, the Morse code here. I would love to say this is amazing. This is a secret message. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, I got halfway disappointed here because the Morse code literally translates to this. C, W, S, and then a number, and then the letter. So it's essentially just C, W, S, 1, uh, A, 2, uh, 1, A, 1, B, 2, A, 2, B, 3, A, 3, C, and the last one is C, W, S, 4. But before we get into that, let's read out these stages. I will go over the alpha stages first, and then the beta stages, and then end with the final one. So for the alpha stages, we have figure skating. Phase 1 of the def uh, Department of Defense's Special Ops exercise. Trenches Alpha. Phase 2 of the Department of Defense's Special Ops exercise. And then Rally Alpha. Phase 3 of the Department of Defense's Special Ops exercise. For the beta versions we have figure skating beta. Dance on the ice. Trenches beta. Slitter through the trenches. Rally Beta, Dash Through the Course, and our final stage is titled Supernova, Splendid and Lonely. Yet again, a apt descriptor for Kirsten. So that would be it, the only thing left are the medals, so let us proceed. Alright, and now it's time for the metal lore. <laughs> so let us begin from the bottom and work our way up towards the uh, final one. On the bottom we have Convergence. You understood that this act was not Kirsten's alone. She stands for countless dreams and aspirations. The next one is Wings of Freedom. Medal awarded by the Department of Defense for completing all special ops. You are aware that war has changed and you must be ready. Civil Unity. The Tin Man thanks you for your help behind the scenes and gifts you this medal. The conflict between the Maylander Foundation and the Department of Defense is in the past. The future belongs to Columbia. The next one is Gravity Engineering Medal. You have gotten the hang of changing gravity. The experience will come in handy someday. You don't say, Medal. The next one is Gravity Expert. You have gained a firm grasp on the application of gravity. Director Nasty of Ryan Lab has taken an interest in you. She awaits your visit. Again, the second medal in a row that is like foreboding for the future. <laughs> but moving on. Top Agent. You successfully completed all missions. You have caught the eye of the Mailender Foundation. Columbia needs people like you. The next one is the medal The Future. The one inevitable meaning that life ultimately seeks. That is the medal that I mentioned earlier that unlocks once you uh, complete the final story note and appears after the final sentence is said. The next medal is Project Logistics Medal. The special case contact uh, the special case contact rates your contribution highly. Columbia is willing to pay if you are willing to work. The next one is from past to future. Her eyes are different when you see her again. Some are obsessed with the past, others with the future. She is the bridge that connects them. And the final medal is Goodnight Terra. You saw true stars in the sky. The sun rises again. May starlight ever be in your heart. So, with that completed, Let's go to the quick ramble section. Man oh man, what to say about this story in the in the closing section besides... Oh 
Boy, there was a lot here and a lot to unpack. A, a lot of stuff happened, a lot of progress was made, a lot of reveals were done, a lot of foreshadowing was done as usual, and, uh, uh But yeah, uh, in general speaking, this was amazing. <laughs> it did, however, the only... If I had to pick something uh, a bit uh, tedious about the story, it would, might be the beginning of it being very stretched out, or at least it feels like it's stretched out, like it's, there's maybe too much meandering at the beginning, but at the same time, there is not much meandering at the beginning, because we see so many groups of people moving at the start of the story that it's uh, very hard to say uh, that that's a bad thing. We had so many uh, characters there that uh, their paths had to be portrayed properly, the ambitions, what is happening, where they're going, who they're meeting, uh, so on and so forth, until the paths intersected at one point. Pretty much everything intersects at one point, and then it splits into kind of two separate directions, yet just like we discussed earlier, all directions seek one thing, and that is the truth. And oh boy, did we find a lot of truth. Uh, going from the Preserver, the Sarcophagus, that, that whole thing being just a giant graveyard now of, of the kin of uh, the Doctor just pretty much being dead in all of those things, uh, to uh, finally shattering the skies open and showing people what is out there and uh, seeing the true face of space. Uh, we'll see how that works. Uh, I'm mostly looking forward to seeing how future stories go, uh, because, especially stories that are set po post this uh, point in time, because I wanna, uh, I wanna see if, and or rather how long the tear in the barrier is gonna maintain. Like the Preserver said, the tear is gonna be there, but the question is, for how long? Is it gonna be days? Is it gonna be weeks? Is it gonna be years? Uh, I guess we'll see. It will definitely be some time, and people will have enough time to observe uh, what is beyond the barrier, but eventually it will close itself up again, and then it's just a, I guess, a question of time until the people on Terra finally get to a technological point where they can accumulate either enough energy to pierce the barrier, or we're just gonna bypass it by using the aforementioned portal up in the north, but... Uh, which is obviously something that will happen, but I also wonder if at the same time uh, they will still try and keep uh, keep trying to pierce the barrier again in the future. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, a lot of stuff happened. Uh, but first, let me go over the stuff uh, that I set out be at the beginning of the story. I said a couple of things at the beginning uh, that I'm looking forward to if they will happen. And um, I think I almost hit a complete bingo. <laughs> Which is, oh god, why was I so right? Uh, well, most of them were just like uh, broad terms that I posted at the beginning, but uh, well, we did learn about the false sky and what is the cause and that the barrier is actually projecting a false sky above the lands of Terra. We didn't learn anything about what I added uh, during the section with uh, the false moon. Still no real confirmation if one of the moons is false or not. We do know from Amia's uh, thing that I included from the module uh, that the this ancient civilization was capable of literal, literal planetary engineering. Uh, maybe still one of the moons is artificial? Who knows? We'll see in the future, I guess. But uh, definitely learned about the barrier. Uh, quite a lot about the barrier's behavior as well. Uh, and in the final segments of uh, the conversation between Kirsten and uh, Kirsten and uh, the Preserver that we see as a flashback on a black screen at the, at the very end, we do learn a couple of other things, but it's very broad strokes. The only, the only notable thing in there is the mention of Talos. The other things get just mentioned like, yeah, these are things that exist in the universe, like a gigantic black hole. Uh, a, a gigantic star, you know, it's the usual stuff. Oh, what can, what, what could I list you out of the un about the universe if I just look up at the sky? Well, uh, there are there are stars out there, which are suns in other <laughs> solar systems out there in our in our galaxy and for beyond. Uh, there's probably some black holes somewhere. 
Uh, and uh, there are stars that are so gigantic that our very own star looks like a goddamn pebble. Or even a grain of sand. But, yeah. <laughs> that's, the, that's in broad strokes. And that's pretty much what the Preserver did say there. However, one thing, like I said, stood out. And that is the, uh, the name Talos. Which is obviously the name of both the planet and uh, one of the satellites that are on the planet. Uh, Talos 2. Where Enfield takes place. And um, looking forward to that game when it comes out. Finally, to explore and see what's happening there. And... Uh, well, you know this channel, it's gonna be a lot of lore diving. Oh boy, I hope you're ready for those future future streams for that game. We're gonna be diving deep. Uh, but anyway, uh, the next thing I set out was learning about uh, Mulesis' past, which we did. Uh, we learned how she came to be a researcher, at least, and uh, we learned quite a bit about the elves as well on, on top of that. Now, I did also say, along the lines that if we are learning about Mulesis' past, that we're also gonna learn about the Doctors. Oh boy, did I not know what I said there. <laughs> I had no clue what would be happening. Holy lord of... lore. Uh, first off, 13,000 plus years ago, uh... Priest as being very intrinsically linked to Originium, to its existence. Uh, in what shape or form, Preserver didn't specify, but uh, she is somehow linked to it. Um, Calcet obviously being a construct of sorts, uh, that is uh, accompanying the Doctor into the future and helping out and preserving, pretty much overseeing the world, uh, in a sense, doing her thing, essentially. Um, then, uh, the, oh my god, the debate. I, I'll be, I'll be clear here. The moment, the moment the screen went to black, or rather to white, and, uh, when it went into the forest and the, and the chill music starts, uh, I was just asking in my brain on original reading, not with, uh, the narration, obviously, but on original reading, just asking myself, what is happening? What is about to happen? Why is, why is the doctor in a forest? And then she appears. Just my whole body shut down for a full minute. <laughs> I was just staring at the screen while she was there. That's how much that, that scene hit uh, for that moment. I've been with the game for four years now. And, uh, well, almost full four years. It's gonna be in January. But uh, uh, that is one of those images that since the, uh, since the uh, main story, early main... Well, early... Act 1 main story remained in my head and I was wondering when we we're gonna learn and see more about Priestess. Sadly, this Priestess was just a projection and uh, not the actual one. The rest of the characters that appear throughout it are essentially also projections uh, picked from uh, picked from the Doctor's mind. The only one that appeared to be actually real uh, also appeared as a projection of course, but still an actual person in there uh, and it would make sense that she would be capable of uh, hopping in, is uh, Theresa at the end. Now, at the beginning, I didn't give it much mind, like everybody else appeared, uh, and I'm very sure no one else questioned it when she also appeared, but there was a specific moment before the doctor suddenly asks, Theresa, is that you? Uh, where my brain, even before that popped up on the screen, started going like, she is responding in a way different tone than everybody else so far. And I started thinking, is that actually her? What is happening? And then the doctor asks the direct question, and she pretty much confirms, yeah, I'm doing a favor right now. <laughs> like, oh boy. But yeah, very interesting developments. Um, we learn an extra bit about the crown as well, uh, from uh, that that is floating about Amia's head. Uh, which I also read out in the uh, module story. And uh, it not just being able to store data uh, as the module story depicts, like the actual world history data, factual, but it also... I mean, we already know that Amia can use it to... or that specific power used to kind of manipulate people's emotions, but the Preserver pretty much specifying that it could be used on a way bigger scale to just make everybody chill the hell out basically robbing everybody of their uh, free will? That is a scary thought. 
Uh, seeing a bit about Kalsit as well during the debate was nice. Pretty much the whole sequence here with Kalsit made me like her and understand her more as a, as a character and a person in this world. The whole spiel of her uh, wanting the Doctor to become this new person, not to be the old, as we know, as we know for people, from people saying in the past, the Doctor is that cold, calculating kind of uh, character from the past, not really connecting to the people around them. Well, not on a personal level, at least, collect, collect, connecting as they should be, but, uh, but uh, now that we have a new person who is essentially, yes, slowly remembering, like, stuff from the past, not like specific memories, but like, uh, calculations, mathematical formulas, uh, basically in, in, innately knowing how to formulate plans very quickly. It's it's almost like muscle memory reacting to what the body wants to do, essentially, while you're, while you're not even aware that you're doing it. Uh, it's there, but it's not an actual memory that they are accessing. Well, not fully for most of the stuff, but... Uh, yeah, and the um, scary part about it being if the memories would flood too quickly in, that the old self could overwrite the new self. Now, if the memories keep trickling back in from this point onward uh, gradually and naturally, I don't think it can happen anymore. The current Doctor is way too linked to the people around them. Uh, the connection is too strong, I would say. And even if, uh, the, if the memories trickle in slowly over time, nothing, I think, of significance will happen outside of uh, them remembering who they were and what they were doing and uh, the past essentially but the current one would probably more than likely stay as the way they are <laughs> the little the little goofball uh, but yeah a lot a lot of food for thought during that whole whole sequence uh, looking also forward to seeing more in the future when uh, they actually reveal more about priestess and uh, it's I I have a I have a sneaking suspicion the next time Priestess comes up it's gonna be through somehow through the Doctor's memories. But anyway, going back to my list, uh, considering that Rosmontes and Ifrit were in the trailer, like I, like I was I think discussing in part one at the beginning, uh, seeing uh, well Ifrit she, Ifrit was in there not to clean up her past or rather make peace with her past. She already made pe peace with it as we see in the module short story. T and she becomes one with the flame. Uh, but this one was more about uh, seeing her in her current, more grown-up state. And uh, foreshadowing from the future that she is probably going to become a, uh elite operator. But it was nice, finally, to round up Rosmontes' thing. Because Rosmontes, uh, like I said as well, I think, during the series, uh, it didn't really get much... Uh, in the story mention uh, outside of her memory stuff, but her files very, as you've seen as well in one of the parts, very explicitly talk about uh, how her powers are or how they appear to be, the experiments uh, from Loken Water Tank and stuff like that. And I'm quite happy that we got this story where her whole thing got uh, rounded up and that uh, uh, that she uh, essentially didn't physically uh, commit to killing uh, Loken and giving him what he wants, but actually just killed him in her memories. Which I have a feeling that that was fine with him as well. But, yeah, we pretty much got the origins of Rosmontes and saw a bit of the past from the laboratory as well in a flashback. Next on the list uh, were two points that I pointed out just uh, arbitrarily speaking, considering it was very space-themed, very technology-themed. We didn't technically get a name for the planet that the story is taking on, where Arknet is situated on. However, they keep more and more addressing themselves as Terrans, so I do wonder if this name will stick into the future. I kind of hope it does, because... What's the point at this point not naming the planet? I know that they only know the one continent and uh, they don't know the entire world yet, but at this point, I think with the skies being shattered open, they can just embrace the name for the planet and just call it Terra. Uh, 
I do still hope we do actually learn the actual name of the planet sometime in the future, but uh, that's that's for the future. And the final thing, and I already said it, was a connection to Enfield, and yes, we got quite the confirmation and the connection being the portal up in the north, uh, the door as it was said here, and uh, the naming of Talos, <laughs> pretty much. So everything is in place. Alright, and now for the other aspect. I've already talked about Saria and Silence throughout the whole thing. I did like their arcs uh, going from light into shadow, finally deciding on stuff. Uh, I've seen a lot of discourse here and there about Silence in the story not literally doing anything. And I would counter-argue that she actually, for someone who is a normal-ass person, did a lot of stuff. I know people want their, like characters that they like and stuff to do something very significant, but also at the same time, Silence is a normal ass person. She was a lab, uh, she she worked at, at Ryan Lab at, at a normal position and she kept going and going and going after all the darkness that she witnessed and uh, finally found a way forward only to stumble again, stand up again, stumble again, stand up again. She is not really a quitter. She keeps going, and uh, she is she is going for the ethics in science. Because as Ryan Lab was up until the very end of the story here, Ryan, Ryan Lab was pretty much under Kirsten and other other directors. Well, if you want to do it, we'll do it. Screw the consequences, I guess. But uh, she is going for the ethics. Like, yes, science is great. Do it, but you know need to know the limits. You need to know how far you can go before you're starting to either damage yourself or the people around you and people who are involved with the experiments. So ethic ethics in science, please. And um, I do hope that she will actually succeed on uh, that path. So that was nice. Sa uh, Saria also finding her path forward, uh, finally deciding to face off and uh, ha had a face-off with Kirsten pretty much um, pretty much ending that whole thing <laughs> delivering the message essentially uh, felt also nice and uh, already mentioned Ifrit and Rosmontis having their, their stuff uh, shown off and uh, concluded uh, Mulesies as well seeing more about her was very nice and uh, hearing her talk about the elves and stuff connecting to uh, to her past and uh, learning about her loneliness, essentially, and how similar she actually is in that sense to uh, the Doctor as well, who is pretty much the one and only member of his species at this point that we know of, at least. Uh, then, um, seeing the other directors, uh, I'll say this, seeing the other directors uh, brought them in a new light throughout this entire story, at least I think I said it uh, said it earlier as well. It made them understandable. Uh, it made them more, yeah, well, understandable. I don't know what other word to use there. Uh, like up until this point, yes, they are crazy. They're absolutely crazy. They had no qualms uh, to step over boundaries and do stuff just for the pure purpose of science. But that was also the problem. That's why shit went to some. <sighs> to some very dark alleys, and uh, still, the story did make them understandable. Like, uh, Parvis's fear, essentially, uh, to not both leave anything behind, but also lose himself before he, just as he is in the final uh, moments of achieving something. Uh, Ferdinand, uh, as well, it, like I said earlier, it kinda, this story kinda make me weirdly like him more as a character, which is weird, because I still don't like like him as a person. Still think, think he's a shithead, but him sticking it to Kirsten. Uh, and uh, actually actively wanting to leave something behind for future generations to prove, to prove stuff. I like that. I like this Moxie. Cannot say. Uh, a new character that was completely uh, introduced in this story, being Justin Jr. Honestly, at the beginning of the story, didn't give a flying... F about. However, that one moment in the story where he opens up to that uh, woman for that from that other laboratory that he was recruiting, uh, where he shows his vulnerable side a bit, kind of make me like him immediately. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, 
I understand this guy now. I, I, I get why he is the way he is. Thank you. These, these little moments are always important in story to just understand a character, and th this was this was needed. Uh, Blake, eh, he's a military man. What else can I say about that? He, he, he is, at least in my eyes, he's a complete, complete military man from start to finish. Uh, nothing much to say there. Jackson as well, really don't have much to say about him, outside of he's the vice president, he does what he does, but um, he is also under the fiddle of uh, <laughs> the bird overlord. Um, Kalsit, I also said earlier as well, uh, this story made me understand her way better as a person, uh, and uh, like her way better as a character and as a person, and... Uh, the more the stories move forward in time, the more she is mellowing out. And I wonder where this is gonna lead to in the future. How she is gonna behave. Is she gonna actually start, you know, casually joking with people? Are her sentences gonna become shorter? <laughs> probably not. Probably only longer. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, trying to think here as well, what else? Uh, Preserver? Boy. Now, that's a character I have not seen coming. And what to say, uh, outside of... I feel sad for him. The, the guy... First off, the original person sacrificed himself to become the Preserver. Uh, to watch over his brethren for... Untold millennia. Over 13,000 years of nothing but absolute silence. The guy who kept shouting into space for 13,000 years to get a contact from someone and no one replied back. Woof. Holy shit. That that was like like that sinking feeling of when you when you drive in a car and suddenly the car goes over a hill and down down suddenly. Like that sinking feeling in the stomach uh, kind of feel like boof body. I am... I don't even know how to begin to feel pain for that. Holy shit. You've waited a long time and... And at the end... At the end, no one... No one in the in the pods can be awakened anymore. They were basically on... On life support while the rest of the body was dead. <laughs> or rather, the important organs were dead. Boy, oh boy. But I do wonder if it would have been possible to... Now, actually, if if they were, like, brain-dead-dead, dead, then probably not. I was thinking for a second it would have been possible to, you know, use any kind of arts, special arts, to take out their memories and transfer them into ob other objects. Now, if they're, if they're uh, brain-dead, then that's probably not a thing that can be accomplished. Uh, and uh, the soul stuff is uh, a bit different. But yeah, man, he held on for a long time, and I do feel sorry for the guy. Jesus Christ, but he delivered on so much lore. And uh, finally, I guess, uh, Jara. Well, she was pretty much seeing herself as a replacement mother for Kirsten, and she was fully re supporting Kirsten. And um, I don't really have much to say about her outside of the fact that... Uh, she pretty much did as much wrong as Kirsten did, to a degree. As seen during the argument between her and Silence when they were uh, pretty much uh, fighting during the shaft fire, just before the sha shaft fired off. Uh, but yeah, she absolutely knew what was happening at Rhine Lab in the darkest corner and recesses of Rhine Lab, and uh, she did nothing. She was just supporting. Supporting her dear, dear foster child. Oh boy. I wonder if she's gonna be back at any given point, but we'll see. And, uh... Oh, and yeah, of course, Nasty, the head of engineering. Um... Interesting. Banshee stuff. Uh... Not as powerful as another Banshee. Uh, that we know of, but interesting to see another one. And to see uh, the curse words in action again. 
I wonder if the metal suggests anything like substantial, if there's gonna be any more contact with Nasty specifically, but I guess we'll see into the future. Don't really have much to say about her, outside of the fact that she's just an engineer. She just does things. And, uh, yeah. And the uh, one thing is escaping me right now. Oh yeah, Tin Man. Uh, a Revenant, huh? I was wondering, considering the Tin Man appeared for the first time in the... Uh, the Tin Man appears in two places. The Tin Man appears in, obviously, the manga. Uh, and the manga already uh, placed him as a Sarkaz. I was just wondering what kind of Sarkaz the hell is he, considering he's wearing armor, protecting his entire body, apparently. And he also appears in Integrated Strategies 2, in one of the events that can happen in there. Uh, but yeah, a revenant, essentially a soul. The outer shell, the exoskeleton, is literally just there to give him some kind of form, so he's not like <laughs> a cloud of uh, dankness souping about. But, very interesting. I wonder, again, I wonder if there's gonna be more contact with him in the future, considering he is still obviously with Maylander and stuff, and uh, yeah. Probably one of the more enigmatic and interesting characters, considering his age as well. Uh, oh, and of course, Ho oh, Heliak. Now, here's the thing. I still find her crazy, and uh, if I'm in a room where she is in, I want uh, the absolute most diesel security personnel around myself. Thank you. However, this story actually made me realize why she is the way she is. Why she's so, um, cray-cray. And who wouldn't be crazy? if you would be literally inheriting uh, direct memories from your predecessors. Like, sh her brain is essentially... Uh, imagine... Imagine uh, doing uh, in your computer a cut-paste action. But instead of uh, selecting once you place memories into another, into another vessel, uh, where it says, do you want to overwrite <laughs> the file already existing in there, uh, you say no, and you have now multiple files, and the system goes ape apeshit. Uh, but, yeah, she's essentially carrying uh, the knowledge, memories, and stuff of her uh, of her predecessors. And, um, yeah, I can imagine how that drives a person that insane and why they behave the way they behave. Uh, I wonder what her... Well... I don't really wonder what her stuff is gonna entail. Uh, I, I'm more of the... F of in, in the fact of... If she actually achieves the state of she can actually unlock the Quetzalcoatl powers, essentially the Kukulkan powers of, of old and transform into whatever beast, um, as stated in the story, she will probably not live <laughs> once that is done. Uh, it has been apparently way too many generations in uh, the current uh, in, in the current human form for her. Uh, entire bloodline, so... Yeah, I think if she wants to continue the bloodline, she should stay the way she is, unless she doesn't care anymore, and uh, finds a way to unlock her uh, all potentials. Well, good luck. <laughs> you will have it for uh, a brief moment in time, apparently. And, uh, yeah, I guess this covers it all. Great story. I'm looking forward to what's co what's coming next, and uh, oof, yeah. Well, next is gonna be the um, and I don't remember the title of the story. It's gonna be the Executor uh, Alter story with Laterano stuff, which I'm looking forward to. What's gonna be in there? Considering a lot of the a lot of the Laterano and uh, Sancta stuff has been recently answered, uh, so I wonder how deep and dank that one is gonna go. But uh, as people were saying that the next stories that are literally coming into the game are gonna be all pretty much heavy hitters. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, a lot of stuff is... A lot of stuff that was early in the game cycle that has been established back then is now overlapping and intersecting. And, uh... Yeah, this is gonna be interesting. A lot of, a lot of the stories are overlapping over each other and picking from each other. I mean, this specific story took so much and referenced so much to the main story as well that it's uh, kind of insane. And again, for those of you who 
uh, haven't caught up yet to the current end of the story, aka chapter 12, uh, if you're going through the story, enjoy, uh, and when you find the points that have been referenced so far throughout this whole thing, enjoy those moments as well. But, yeah, I think that's a, that's about covering it all. Uh, my brain empty, story great, uh, characters great, made me understand them way, way, way more, and uh, looking forward what, to what's gonna happen in the future. But for now, thank you all for listening. Uh, if you've liked this video, please consider leaving a like on it. As before, that would help me a lot in the algorithm. Uh, leave a comment uh, how you like the whole story as a whole, and uh, or didn't like it as a whole. I would be interested to read, as always, what you guys have to say. And, of course, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. There is a lot more here on the channel to just sit back, relax and listen to from old and future incoming stories, of course, as they are happening. And um, the journey is not over yet. So, let's keep going. But yeah, thank you all for listening and watching. I hope you have a fantastic day wherever you are, and I will see you in the next one. Until then, bye-bye.